the autumn of 1917, the fields around the Belgian town of Ypres became the scene of one of the most bloody conflicts of World War I. In the heart of the battlefield was a small village which sat on top of a gently sloping ridge. Over a century later, the name of this village has become synonymous with the horrors of the First World War. This is the Battlefield of Passchendaele. People often ask me, what's the most significant aspect of visiting a battlefield from the First World War? And my answer is pretty much always the same, the scale. Until you walk this ground and visit these huge cemeteries, there's really no way of knowing the extent of the death and suffering that occurred here. And when it comes to scale, it doesn't get any bigger than this. Surrounding me are nearly 12,000 graves. And of those, more than 8,000 are completely unidentified. This is Tynecott Cemetery. It's the largest Commonwealth military cemetery on the planet. This isn't just a magnificent cemetery, it's a battlefield in its own right. This was ground that was fought over and that's pretty clearly demonstrated by what I'm standing in front of right here. This is a German blockhouse from the First World War constructed in 1917 to defend this entire area. And there wasn't just one of these, there were dozens of these across the entire ridge line. And on the 4th of October 1917, Australian troops came through here and captured this one and the pillboxes all around us. And you can see the evidence of that fighting. You can see the huge chunks taken out of the masonry by shells coming in and detonating on this structure. The metal is bent and twisted. Just imagine the hurricane of shell fire that resulted in this damage. And there would have been hundreds of Australians, thousands of Australians surging through here, trying to capture these. Germans would have been coming out, setting up machine guns on top and to the side of the pillbox there would have been a sea of barbed wire in front of us and Australians trying to get through the wire and attack these positions with machine guns and rifles and bayonets. And to take massive concrete structures like this often required an act of individual bravery. And just up here, we've got an example of just such an attack. This is the grave of Captain Clarence Jeffries of the Australian 34th Battalion and he led several attacks in this area on concrete pillboxes like the one just behind me. And not far over here on the 12th of October, 1917, he captured several of those structures and then launched an attack on a final one. But that was one attack too many. The gun was turned around on him and he was killed. His men completed the capture of that pillbox and then buried their captain beside it. And there's a, a sad footnote to this story in that Captain Jeffrey's body was then lost after the Battle of Passchendaele and his father actually came out in the early 1920s and led a pilgrimage to try and find his lost son. He was sadly unsuccessful, but soon after, a body was found in this area wrapped in a ground sheet with Captain Jeffrey's initials on it. So they were able to identify him as Captain Clarence Jeffrey's, and he was buried in this spot. And as you can see from this grave, for his gallantry during the Battle of Passchendaele, he was awarded the Victoria Cross. There's a couple of graves over here which really reflect the nature of the fighting in this area. We're in a Commonwealth cemetery, but the two headstones here are German graves containing a number of bodies of Germans who died in fighting in this area. Just behind me, under the cross of sacrifice, there is a German pillbox. It was captured by the Australians in that attack in October 1917. And, and these men with the date of death of the 4th of October were most likely killed defending that pillbox and they would have been buried here right beside the pillbox by the Australians after the fighting had finished. And so it's interesting to see this other side of the story in the middle of all these Commonwealth graves, we've got these two lonely little German graves forever standing guard over the pillbox that they died to defend. Tynecott Cemetery is what's known as a concentration cemetery. And that means that the vast majority of these bodies were brought in after the war and were concentrated in this area. And that also explains why there's so many unknown graves, because after the savage fighting on the Passchendaele battlefield, the shell fire, the mud, the trenches, the pillboxes, it was very easy to lose men 
in this environment. So men who were killed either lay out there and were not recovered until after the war, or they'd been buried by their comrades in small graves and small cemeteries, which were later gathered up and brought here, concentrated into this magnificent space we now have around us. But there's a secret to Tynecott Cemetery, which is often overlooked. And that's the fact that there was a cemetery here during the war, albeit a very, very small one. And I'm standing in it right now. And you can see from the nature of these graves that this is a very different cemetery to the large one that surrounds me. These grave, graves are laid out in a very ad hoc manner. There's, a, there's an urgency to these burials you can see because these men around me were buried during the war while fighting was still going on all around me. These men were buried under fire. So their comrades would have rushed out to bury them by dark quickly to avoid being hit themselves. So it's an extraordinary little corner of what is a magnificent cemetery. The savage nature of the fighting in this area resulted in tens of thousands of unknown soldiers and they're scattered throughout the cemetery. But the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, or as it was known at the end of the war, the Imperial War Graves Commission, made a very far-sighted decision. They wanted every man to be remembered by name, either on a headstone or on a memorial. And so in the town of Ypres, not far from here, there's the magnificent Men and Gate Memorial, which contains 54,000 names of unknown soldiers. But horrifically, they realized during the construction of the gate that there was not going to be enough room for all the missing soldiers. And so here in Tynecott Cemetery, we have another memorial to the missing. And this one contains 35,000 names of men killed in and around this area. It's just such a sobering reminder of the savage, brutal nature of the fighting that so many of these men could be killed and today have no known grave. I'm in the middle of the Passchendaele battlefield and walking through the remains of an old railway cutting. Now, in the smashed landscape of 1917, this was one of the few landmarks on the battlefield, one of the few parts of the man-made landscape that hadn't been completely destroyed by shell fire and disappeared into the mud. And so naturally during the fighting, this area all around me became a safe haven for wounded men as they retreated from Passchendaele after the horror of that battle. And right in this area where we are, one of the most iconic photographs of the entire war was taken. Just up here on the left bank, photographer Frank Hurley came here right where I'm standing. He saw shattered Australians, both dead and wounded, sheltering in this bank after the horror of the Battle of Passchendaele. And he said it was hard to differentiate between the living and the dead. I'm standing in what could be any typical Belgian or French village. I'm surrounded by clean streets and quite prosperous houses. But don't let appearances fool you because this is the village of Passchendaele. And during the fighting here in 1917, it was completely destroyed by shell fire. There was not a house left standing, not a road, not a cobblestone remaining in what was just a sea of mud and shell holes. And we're at the point where some of the fiercest fighting of the entire campaign occurred. After the British, the Australians, the New Zealanders had all been forced back by the Germans, it was Canada's turn to come into the line. And in weeks of brutal fighting, the Canadians eventually succeeded in capturing the village, but at a huge cost. More than 16,000 Canadians were killed or wounded in these fields where I'm standing. And for their efforts, they received nine Victoria Crosses, the most ever awarded to Canadians in a single action. So it's an extraordinary spot. We're surrounded by beautiful maple leaves. The leaves are just starting to turn on the trees. We've got this wonderful memorial 
and it's an incredibly fitting spot to remember those men from Canada who came and died in these fields around me. One of the most difficult things about visiting Passchendaele today is just trying to get your head around how much this landscape has changed since 1917. If we had been here then, just over a hundred years ago, this would have been a sea of mud and shell craters with no features visible whatsoever. And men would have been falling all around us. So in that hellish environment, natural features became paramount on the battlefield. And there's one of those just over here to my left. It doesn't look like much, but this shallow valley is the Ravabeek. And because it was a valley, because it was one of the few features on the battlefield that provided any sort of protection, as the Allied troops pushed forward up this hill and came under machine gun and artillery fire, they gathered in here because it did provide a small measure of protection. But what that meant is as men started to get hit, wounded men would crawl into this valley and sadly there many of them died. So it's almost impossible to imagine. I mean, look across at this field, it's green, it's beautiful. This was hell on earth in 1917. In this valley, a hundred years ago, this would have been choked with dead and dying men. In these fields all around me, thousands of men were killed. And sadly, many of them still lie beneath the ground today. This is the Canadian Memorial at St. Julien. And it's a, quite a magnificent depiction of a Canadian soldier with arms rested remembering his fallen comrades. It's known as the brooding soldier. But we're here for slightly more than just to remember the fallen sons of Canada, because this is a historic site. It was on this location that poison gas was first used during the First World War. And it was at the start of the Second Battle of Ypres. And this sector was guarded by French colonial troops and Canadian troops. And they saw a strange cloud drifting over them from the German lines and it was the first time chlorine gas had been released against enemy troops. And the results were disastrous for the Allies. Many men were overcome, as many as a thousand were killed, and a huge gap opened up in the line as the troops fled. Ironically, the Germans had not anticipated how effective the gas would be, and so they failed to exploit the breakthrough. But this marked a turning point in the war. From this moment onwards, both sides would employ poison gas not just chlorine, but also phosgene, tear gas, and most famously, mustard gas. This is a really important site in a horrific war. This marks a particularly horrific chapter, the first use of poison gas. Well, we found something pretty special here. We're at the, uh, the Passchendaele 1917 Museum, and they've recreated here a First World War tunnel system. And in towns like this one, Zonnebeck, where we are now, there were rabbit warrens of tunnels created like this beneath the town during the First World War. And I mean, this is a recreation. We can't deal with the stench and the mud and the blood of the First World War, but it gives us a good representation. And things here like the latrines, the idea of sanitation when you're living underground, essential for men's well-being when they come down to these tunnel systems. And you can see why men chose to go underground. Everything above ground was pulverized. There was nothing left, not a brick, not a tree left above ground. All that there was was machine gun fire and in particular artillery fire. And life up there when it became too tough to deal with, men came underground for protection. And just imagine what it would have been like for weeks on end, men living in these cramped tunnels. And if anything, I think these tunnels are wider and taller than they would have been during the First World War. These are designed for tall tourists, not for the fighting men of the First World War. But I think they've done a wonderful job. This is something that we would never have the chance to experience, but this recreation gives us that opportunity. And the Germans in particular became very adept at using these underground fortifications for protection and they used them to great effect here in Ypres and also during the Battle of the Somme when they were able to shelter and avoid that initial bombardment and then come up and use their machine guns to such great effect. So this is great, this is living history. It's not original, but it is a wonderful recreation and it gives us a perfect example of what life was like for these men underground more than a century ago.
wonderful recreation at the Passchendaele 1917 Museum about a First World War trench system. It's not really a recreation of a trench system, it's a recreation of multiple trench systems. At the moment, I'm in a German trench system, which is a communication trench, which would lead to the front line. You can see that it's been reveted with, with branches and held up with timber A-frames. This is a fairly standard design for a German trench system. And it's, again, it's quite remarkable to be standing here. This isn't Disneyland. We're not trying to play at being soldiers here, but it's just to give you some sort of insight into the historical significance of, of what these men went through and, and the conditions they lived in. These trenches are long gone. We can't see them anymore. Trenches that do remain are just small little ditches in the ground these days. But a system like this enables us to see what it would have been like and where men lived and fought for literally four years of the war. So we're in the British section now, a communication trench. We're walking on quite unstable duck boards, which would have kept the, uh, the mud and the water away from our boots. It's funny, I don't know if you can hear, but there's bird song, there's birds up in the trees. And although not intentional, that's actually part of the story. Soldiers were often quite surprised that they would hear birds twittering away in the trees whenever the guns fell silent. Just those small little pieces of humanity that reminded the men that they were human beings and, uh, and not some sort of strange underground animals. And then as we continue further, now we're getting in more into the fighting section of the trench, which shows what life would have been like in the front line. And this is noticeable because we have things here like a fire step, which would have enabled the men to, to step up and look over the top of the trench. Of course, any man who was foolish enough to do what I'm doing right now would have received a bullet for his troubles. But uh, it's a great recreation of how the trenches worked. Men weren't able to look over the top of trenches like this into no man's land. They were never able to stick their head up and look out into no man's land. So they used periscopes and a whole variety of means to see into the deadly ground that was no man's land. They've got concrete sandbags here, not real sandbags, but concrete sandbags replicating them. And again, a crucial part of the story is that the trenches weren't just bare earth, they were protected by sandbags. And then here we have a dugout built into the side of the trench facing the enemy. This is where men would have slept, where they would have received medical treatment occasionally food and just gotten away even for a few minutes from the horrors of the of the trenches all around them it's it's a remarkable recreation people are in two minds about this sort of thing as to whether it's helps whether it enhances our understanding of the war but i think it does i think if you come here you walk through this trench system even though you know it's not an original trench system it gives you a great insight into just what it was like for those men during those four years of war This is Langemark German Cemetery, and it's one of the largest cemeteries in this area, much larger than the equivalent British or French cemeteries. There's more than 50,000 Germans buried in here, and it's a cemetery that was started during the war, but then greatly expanded afterwards. And I always like coming here because it's an interesting comparison to the British and the French cemeteries, the American cemeteries that you would visit in other parts of the battlefield. And instantly you can see why it's very enclosed. We've got trees all around us. We've got these dark granite slabs set into the ground. The dark crosses. It's very Teutonic. It's a very German way of doing things. And it always makes me think of the significance and the message that these cemeteries are trying to give to people. And it's always my feeling that when a British soldier was lost, it was a loss to his family, which is why we see personal inscriptions and lots of information about the soldier. When a French soldier was lost, that was a loss to his community, which is why in every French village, we see a statue and a memorial commemorating the men who fell. But when a German soldier was lost, it was a loss to the fatherland. And that's really what we can see here. It's a remarkable place, quite different from those British and French cemeteries, trying to convey a very different mood. To me, it really reflects the attitude that Germany felt having lost the First World War. These men paid the same sacrifice as their comrades from Britain or from France, but for them, there was no glorious victory. 
for Germany at the end of the First World War, they were very much within Europe, but not part of it. Although this is most assuredly a First World War cemetery, echoes of the Second World War are not very far away. In the interwar years, there was a redesign of these German cemeteries, and they took on this very stark, almost brutalist design with these monuments, the headstones set flat in the ground, and it was reflective of the way Germany was going in the interwar years, the new regime and the way it wanted to see itself. And that's really why we have this this quite stark, quite enclosed cemetery, which has dark overtones throughout it. Although this is very much a First World War cemetery, it had a very special significance to the Germans that occupied this area during the Second World War. And in 1940, right where I'm standing now, an infamous visitor came to this cemetery and stood on this very spot. And it's fascinating to think about that comparison between the First World War and the German loss and the sense that, that all these men had in some ways died in vain with the Second World War when the Germans came back as triumphant occupiers, at least for a, a few years. And there were some big changes that took place in these cemeteries during the Second World War. The, the Nazis used them as symbols of what had gone before. Jewish graves, for example, were desecrated in, this, in these cemeteries and often the headstones were removed. It's a fascinating insight into two very bloody chapters of history. In the years after the Second World War, there was a remarkable shift that occurred with German cemeteries. The people of Belgium, understandably not being thrilled with having been invaded twice in 25 years, decided that there were too many German cemeteries scattered across the countryside. So they gave the Germans a pretty brutal but specific instruction. We want you to close most of these cemeteries and shift the bodies elsewhere. The question was, what were the Germans to do with these tens of thousands of bodies from these cemeteries they were being forced to close? And I'm standing here in front of the solution to that problem. It looks like a mass grave, but it is in fact a crypt where tens of thousands of remains, in fact, nearly 45,000 remains, were brought together in this one very small space. And the names of the men are now on these plaques surrounding the crypt. So I think it's quite an elegant solution to the problem that they had of where to shift these bodies to. And the Germans refer to these as comrades' graves. And I think that sums it up rather nicely. And speaking of comrades, looking over the crypt, are the ghosts of four of their comrades standing there keeping perpetual watch on their fallen friends. And it's highly unusual to see a depiction of a German First World War soldier anywhere on the former battlefields. Obviously, it's not an imagery that the local people take too kindly to, but I think they've done it well here. The four shapeless figures representing ghostly soldiers forever watching over their comrades, I think is done very nicely. I think it's a really special spot and even today, Occasionally, when they find a German body on the battlefields, they will open this crypt up and put the remains with his comrades. It's a place that never fails to tug at the heartstrings.